Check Podcasts. Hey everyone, and welcome to Political Capital, your source for all the latest in BC politics. I am your host, Rob Shaw, coming to you from the Steam Trunk Distribution Room here at the Czech News World Headquarters in Victoria. Man, what a busy week in BC politics. The legislature is in full tilt. The provincial budget looms on the horizon. We have floor crossings, backbencher drama, more news on addictions treatment and healthcare. Lots to get through. But the Pod Squad is here to break it all down. Jeff, Jillian, and Allie are back. Thank you for being here, and thank you for diving right into, I think, probably the biggest story of the week uh, is that BC Conservative Party now has its first MLA in the legislature in almost a decade. Uh, the Chaco Lakes MLA, John Rustad, crossed the floor, joined the Conservative Party this week. He's a five-term MLA who, you might remember, was ejected by the BC Liberal Party last August over social media posts that appeared to question the science behind climate change, which led to a big split with his leader. He's been an independent since then, joining the Conservatives. Interesting stuff. What do we make of that development? Uh, Jillian, why don't we start with you? Yeah, well, people have been kind of anticipating this ever since uh, Rustad got booted from the Liberal caucus. Um, I think that that was a good call by Falcon. I think it was sort of, you know, his predecessor, um, Andrew Wilkinson, had been criticized for letting too many um, things slide from his uh, caucus. And I think this was a you know an important show of leadership and a, a, a decisive action that he took in saying, you know, we're, there's going to be lines on who we are as a party and believing in climate change is one of them. Um, at the same time, um, you know, the conservatives have been sort of quietly and sometimes not so quietly organizing behind the scenes. They saw a boost um, in 2020 in a couple ridings um, because of the snap election. They were only able to field um, you know, dozen or so candidates, but they grew to almost 30% in a couple of ridings in the north um, where uh, John Rustad is from. Um, also, recently got the Electoral Boundaries Commission report, which uh, showed that Rustad's riding of Nechaco Lakes is going to be um, intact because it's so um, vast, uh, even though it has a smaller population than, than other ridings, um, it's going to stay the same. So uh, his voter base is going to be the same. He has a, a decent chance of probably getting reelected up there. Um, and, you know, as we saw in 2017, you only need a few MLAs to sort of really um, have the balance of power in an election. So it's going to be really interesting to watch to see if the conservatives can build on this um, sort of legitimacy. Um, they've tried before and, and haven't gotten uh, too far off the starting block. So it'll be interesting to see um, where they go next. Yeah, I agree. Uh, the legitimacy you know, that provides to have an MLA in the House is sort of incalculable. Uh, Ali, what do you make of this? Well, the legitimacy comes if they obviously establish uh, party status, which would be someone else joining him, uh, joining John Rustad. I think this week, everyone wanted to know what Kevin Falcon was thinking. And so he said that he was confident that his caucus would stay with him and that no one would join John Rustin. And I think that's true. Ultimately, if I'm an MLA, I'm not going to move to the BC Conservatives that don't necessarily have a proven track record quite yet. I mean, they, yeah, sure had candidates in the two by-elections in Vancouver, Colchena, uh, and in Surrey South. Uh, that's uh, Dallas Brody and um, uh, a uh, young South Asian gentleman. And I'm sure that they will have someone in Langford by election as well. Uh, but I don't think that by any means that that's a recipe for winning. I mean, we're talking about the BEC Conservatives right now, and this is the most media attention they're ever going to get. So I, I think this is probably a nothing story moving into next week. Yeah. Okay. It's interesting. Jeff, what do you think? Oh, I, th I think it's a very interesting uh, story. Um, uh, big challenge to Kevin Falcon. He's going to make the BC Liberals BC United. Uh, I recall when John Rustad left, it was less about his views on climate change and more that he didn't return phone calls to Kevin Falcon and that bothered Kevin Falcon. So Kevin gave him the boot. But be that as it may, he's now a BC Conservative. And it will be interesting to see from my perspective 
if in this day and age when uh, right wing media in the States is so pervasive in our uh, society now and, uh, uh, you know, social media has created these, uh, uh, you know, little communities of, of, of very entrenched right wing, dedicated right wing folks, if this is the election where uh, conservatives actually make some inroads in British Columbia, I don't think so. Uh, I think history has shown that votes who voters will park their votes with conservatives between elections and they'll either not vote at all in an election uh, for the conservative for anyone or they'll they'll vote for uh, B.C. liberals. But big opportunity here for the B.C. Greens. They can nominate a candidate to take on uh, uh, the climate denier in chief in the Chaco Lake and focus their efforts on that instead of focusing on trying to beat the NDP in uh progressive urban ridings and taking out outstanding MLAs like Brittany, Brittany Anderson. Well, I will resist the urge to talk about the part of the Venn diagram where the green base and the PPC base overlaps, but nonetheless, we'll say that for an entire uh, different day. Let's go around and talk about this again, because I think there's some fascinating sort of scenarios and things that might come out. One being that media coverage, does this give John Rustad a chance to access the rebel news kind of you know media coverage that uh, the BC Liberals aren't cultivating uh, and and speaking to that audience. The other being, you know, Ali, you pointed out one more MLA who comes over gives the Conservatives' official party status in the legislature. That's money, staff, a thirty thousand dollar salary bump up if you're the leader uh, in the House. Uh, so there's that kind of dynamic. And then also, and I just want to throw this out there, the last time we had a conservative MLA, John Van Dongen in 2012, he immediately hit loggerheads with the conservative leader at the time, John Cummins, who's not there. And so will we see that kind of dynamic, the MLA being the legitimate one, the conservative leader right now, Trevor Boland being the party leader setting the policies, does that become the kind of uh, implosion of how this usually works? And then the vote splits. That, that Jeff touched on. Let's just go around again and kind of hit all of those issues because I think they they add this kind of real world dynamic. Of, Ali, I think you mentioned 27, or Jillian, you mentioned 2017, 189 votes in Courtney Comox that lost the, the Liberal government, their majority in a riding where there were 2,000 conservative votes. So there is that dynamic too. Uh, Jeff, let's stay with you. What, uh, expand on those themes and what jumps out at you. Well, it's an, it's an interesting scenario where John Rustad is more name recognition than your actual party leader. I think that might speak to the challenges that the B.C. Conservatives will have in the next election. Uh, I think that uh, Rustad is probably making the rounds in Victoria right now to backbench MLAs in the B.C. Liberal Caucus, who, in the event that Kevin Falcon ever forms government, uh, would no doubt be passed over in cabinet. And like... Hyman Roth did with Fredo and Godfather 2, make him an offer. There's something in it for you. You get party status, you get funding, you get position, and you get to be part of a, a movement that's actually going to listen to you. I disagree with them uh, politically. I think uh, they're the absolute wrong direction. I hope that no conservatives are elected in the next election. But um, interesting challenges for uh, uh, Kevin Falcon. Isn't that the one where he took Fredo out in, in the lake in the middle of the We're not going to talk about what happened to Fredo after he took okay, the sorry. deal. A, We're not going to talk right, about that, that. Okay. Yeah, that, right. <laughs> he was um, killed in the lake. <laughs> <laughs> Spoiler alert. Godfather yeah. 2 just spoiled right now. If you, were, if you had it on your list, it's been ruined. Um, they all die. It was a dream. Anyways, uh, Jillian, <laughs> the <laughs> luring over another MLA, the Rustad uh, leader dynamic, the vote split, uh, the, the media coverage. What do you make of those issues? Yeah, well, I mean, the 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 factor of having you know an MLA in the House who's not the leader um, and a leader outside the House is a, is a really interesting one because it really comes down to personality. I mean, I think that they're probably has never been a political party, no matter how um, small, uh, that doesn't have a little bit of ego uh, at play. Um, you know, people have been speculating that the, the Conservatives might get a new leader, um, that it could be somebody, you know, who's, who's quite ambitious, um, and it'll all come down to whether, you know, uh, that person and uh, Restad can kind of put their egos aside and work together and sort of share 
um, their sort of areas of responsibility um, for the good of their party uh, if they're going to be successful. But, you know, we've seen many times, um, you know, federal greens come to mind that even in small parties, egos um, and personalities can sort of um, turn parties inwards and lead lead them to, you know, squabbling over sort of small potatoes inside the party rather than focusing on what they should be doing, which is building parties. And it's very hard. You know, we have I worked for a smaller party um, trying to break through with the the BC Greens. Um, There are the the two big parties are very well organized, very well established. They have lots of um, incumbent MLAs who don't need as much um, work and, and training to sort of get up and running come election time. So smaller parties really have their work cut out for them. So they've got a, a steep hill to climb. Um, the vote split for sure, I think could be a factor. Um, we saw in Surrey South, the conservatives still get 10% and the BC liberals still win that riding. Um, by-elections are, are sort of unique, um, beasts. Um, we could see, you know, you reference Courtney Comox, um, that vote split certainly could, uh, play a role in, uh, a general election. I think, um, especially, you know, what is kind of driving this dynamic broad strokes is the very uh, intense divisions between the conservatives and the liberals at the federal level, obviously, and um, where, you know, provincial voters used to be able to sort of see themselves um, adhering to to both brands, depending on the level of election they were voting in. Um, that's getting harder and harder to manage, which is, you know, driving the, the, the name change to BC United. Um, so I think it's, it's going to be a really tough thing for, for the Liberals uh, to to straddle. Um, and it's going to be, yeah, fascinating to watch. Yeah, and those, are all, those are all great points. Allie, there's a ton on the table. Let me add one more. Is If the Conservatives improve their performance, even without winning ridings, they get more money under our per-vote subsidy system that the NDP brought in as part of corporate union donations. So in some ways, it's a becomes a perpetual motion machine if the party can do any better than last time they get more money to organize for the next time plus all the other issues i just put out there on the table uh what do you think well they're they're still certainly still starting out right like if you take a look at their website this is a new logo that was launched just recently within like the last six months Uh, they're still trying to figure out their voice what they stand for i think the challenge here is going to be who are they? Because it's they they can have great candidates sign up and run for them, but how are they going to differentiate themselves from any other political party? And it won't be because of the the brilliant personalities and at the leadership. It'll be because of policy. People don't necessarily vote for uh, that one MLA that's going to represent this one community up north in the Chaco Lakes, but rather. Uh, what are the ideas that we could potentially put forward for the entire province? So I think that's going to be the most interesting piece in all of this is how they set themselves apart from the BC Liberals. Or are they going to, is John Rusak going to end up finding himself agreeing with the BC Liberals um, in the legislature? Mm-hmm. On some issues, I'm sure that they will. He'll, yeah. he'll, he'll agree with, oh, he'll agree with uh, Renee Merrifield on vaccine mandates. So they, they've got some uh, common ground there that they're, they're tilling, but we'll see how it all plays out in reality on the ground. Yeah. Okay. That's a lot on the Conservatives. Uh, as you mentioned, Ellie, that's more publicity than they've, yeah. they've gotten quite a while. <laughs> quite a while. Uh, on to That'll be the last time health. we talk about the Conservatives on the podcast <laughs> ever. Yes. Well, we'll see. I have, I have a feeling we always end up talking a lot about them during election campaigns, kind of like the youth vote and other things that sort of fail to materialize, but we all spend a lot of time uh, talking about them. But anyways... Let's go on to mental health and addictions. Quite a bit occurred on that file this week. We're going to start with Richmond Center MLA Teresa Watt, who went on a Mandarin news show and said that the Liberals are very opposed to so-called safe injection sites, which is not the party's position. She had to later say she misspoke. Falcon reacted by reiterating some support for safe injection, and then he took a shot at a safe injection facility that uh, in the downtown east side, only to realize later he'd criticized the wrong one. The issue here, I guess, is whether Watt was trying to say one thing to a certain uh, ethnic community, particularly Vancouver's Chinatown, where there's a lot of upset uh, business owners and others with crime and and addictions fueled issues there, even if it's not the party's position and that that political dynamic of navigating mental health and addictions. We've talked about it before and the solutions, but in political parties trying to speak to different people at different times. So, uh, Ali, what does that whole issue kind of uh, bring up in your mind? 
I'm not convinced this was the gotcha moment that uh, the NDP think it was. Elected representatives know that everything they say, whether it's on social media, it, in front of a camera, or in a room just talking to a friend, it's all going to become public. Everything you say becomes public. And so I don't think that, I, I truly believe that she did misspeak. Uh, but this also speaks to a, a larger piece where political communication and discipline is just so key. And this is why uh, political organizations just have, if they have a strong spokesperson, you see that person every single time uh, in front of the camera, they, they say the same thing every single time. It's really hard to do. Uh, but I just, I really don't think that this was the big story that the NDP made it out to be. Because ultimately, you know, when you're representing your community and when you take that role as an elected representative, everything you say for the rest of your life is now public. So yeah. it was always meant to, to be public and out there. Okay, Jeff? Oh, I, I, I agree that, the, um, uh, that it was meant to be out there. I agree that Kevin Falcon is being clear about uh, where he really stands on these issues of mental health and addiction. And he's using treatment as a political shield to be able to, to attack and go after safe injection sites and decriminalization um, and safe supply because he knows it appeals to a certain political base. Uh, and he's doing this even though, even though he knows these treatments save lives and are an important part of a thoughtful mental health and addiction re response that focuses on saving lives, um, getting people into treatment and to so supporting people in their recovery. I don't think it was misspeaking. I don't think it was gotcha. I think it was just a clear statement of where the BC liberals are at on mental health and addiction. I appreciate and I I think it's good that they're focused on treatment and in boosting treatment. They're absolutely right that we should boost treatment. I think that's a message that gets lost when they do and say things that undermine things that dedicated people and communities are doing to save lives so we can get people into treatment and make their lives better. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess I'd follow that if it, if it was someone other than Teresa Watt, who we're going to talk about later in the show, is uh, not being the... But it wasn't just her. Like, Kevin Falcon and his... He went after uh, uh, the safe injection sites in the downtown east side, calling them a mess. And that's a pretty clear pl political signal to, to folks in the community about where you stand on those. Sure. Uh, Although I, I uh, you know, so, and so it's hard I, to I go into the downtown east side. The whole party. Sure. I mean, it'd be hard to go into the downtown east side and not say the situation's a mess, though, right? Like that's just that's the not sky what you said. Blue. We, we all the situation. Not the situation was a mess. It was the res the safe injection site response to the challenges sure. in the downtown east side. Okay. No. Oh, I take your point there, Jillian. Let, let's bring you in, but expand the issue here because. We're talking about this because of the liberal addictions uh, plan that came out earlier this month, which was very popular uh, with a lot of people. Uh, but at the same time, we are hearing, and I was uh, writing about this week, that the NDP have a plan to match that and that they're going to take some of the liberal plan, uh, things like eliminating fees for beds, expanding the Redfish Healing Center model, that kind of thing, and make it their own billion dollar plan that will come out very soon uh, as well. So. That dynamic of the parties jockeying for a position, the NDP matching the Liberals, who gets credit for this if they want credit, what do you make of that? Well, you know, I think, I remember we've talked about this on the show before. I think Katie and I had a back and forth about how, when the, the NDP was asking, um, you know, what's Kevin Falcon's plan for this and that, um, you know, that there's an argument that it's not the opposition's job to to come up with ideas. It's, it's their job to hold the, the government to account. But I, I disagree with that. I think it's always struck me as a little bit absurd that we have so many MLAs could be like almost, you know, half um, that just sit there and their only job is, is to criticize. I mean, certainly um, there's an important legislative function for that. Um, you know, picking apart bills and, and, you know, showing up in question period and, and holding to the, go the government to account. But I think it, it is great to have opposition parties um, propose ideas and to see them adopted by the government. Um, I think no party has a monopoly on good ideas. And I also think, you know, on the political side for the Liberals, they had to do something um, to show uh, British Columbians what they're offering. I think, you know, the brand has been so diminished by such a, you know, awful um, election platform in 2020. Um, 
And, you know, I think Falcons, you know, had trouble breaking through getting known. I think that this, um, as hard as it, it must be to swallow, I'm sure that they, they knew that this was a risk coming forward with it. Um, and I think that they should be looking at this as a win um, and that they're, you know, they've got good ideas and, and th- because the government wants to implement them. Um, of course, come election time, they're going to have to keep some things in their back pocket to uh, distinguish themselves and, and to show why they're the better option. But I, you know, I, I really think that we shouldn't always be thinking about these in in crude political terms. Um, You know, it's a win if your ideas are implemented because, you know, you want to see progress on those issues for people not because you want to get more seats. Speaking of crude political terms, Jeff, uh, should Falcon be doing the whole who's the man of action now thing when the NDP uh, roll out (laughs) essentially a version of his his platform? Well, we could have we could have competing sashes and it would be an interesting (laughs) dynamic. Um, uh, There's two schools of thought on this. I think the, the, the main overarching, and I agree 100% with Jillian, it's that there's agreement across parties for taking these kinds of steps, and that's good, and that's what's in the interest of the community. And so uh, you applaud that. And I think that's why, on substance, David Eby was very warm to what Kevin Falcon uh, suggested uh, when he suggested it. Uh, I was listening to a Vancouver radio station this morning, and there's a the, one of the deans of the BC legislature, Vaughn Palmer, said that there's an alternative thought on this. It's, was it the NDP taking the liberal ideas and putting them in the budget? Or was it the liberals catching wind of what the NDP was already planning to do in the budget and getting out in front and ahead of them uh, to get a win? Either way, works out well for the the BC liberals uh, and positions them better on this space than they were uh, before. But I think this was very much about BC liberals getting an inkling from talking with stakeholders, folks in the community about steps that were underway, uh, to increase funding and do projects like this in the budget. And they got ahead of it and announced it publicly. And they're going to get some kudos for having done that. But uh, I, yeah. I, I don't think it was, oh, the NDP saw the ideas and they loved them. I think that maybe they, if, they, if they loved them, it was because they had the ideas already. But if you, I mean, that's why the government employs 700,000 communications people, right? So that you can you can indicate that you're about to do something not just sit there silently until your opponents do it before you. Like I, I, oh, I don't got to get it through Treasury Board, Rob. There's all these processes oh, to make sure that I, it's all. You get I a got you. scoop okay. shaw. So they all scoop sit shaw. there paralyzed scoop, until it goes through Treasury Board, like two days before it's announced. Like I mean, fine. Like if if that's what happened, terrific. But I would say if that is what happened, uh, somebody in the army of comms people and government should go back and figure out a better way you can foreshadow when you're about to bring in a solution to the largest problem the province is facing right now so you don't oh, look like you're I'm just saying what Bon Palmer you. said. That's all I'm saying. Sure. He's a good dude. Anyways, he is, I, I defer to Von Palmer. We will be back next week with all the latest here on Political Capital.